Father, we just want to magnify you this morning. We praise you and we worship you this morning, dear Lord. So we continue to invite you into our hearts. Let our hearts be still and focus on you only. Father, I, I pray especially for our youth who are leading this service. Father, whatever they are doing, let, it, let them realize that they're doing it to you, unto your honor and to your glory, and not for what the world of friends may say. Father, I ask that you continue to remain with Antoinez, Brother Antoine, as he leads the service, and our pastor who would continue to bring your message of truth. Steady the feet of those who are, are braving the, the wet streets to come here so that we can all worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you, Lord. We love you and we thank you for all that you continue to do for us and all that you will do even in, in this coming week where we know not what lies ahead, but Father, we know that we place it in your hands and all will be well. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before you all sit, <clears throat> we're going to have the responsive reading by Danae Belliard and Sonley Eames. Good morning, church. Our responsive reading is taken from Psalms 103. We will read responsively. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his Who forgives all your sins and heals all your disease. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your, mo your youth is renewed like the eagles. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As a father, his compassionate on ch his children, so the Lord has compassionate on those who fear him. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. But for everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with his, their children, children. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, all heavenly hosts, you his servant who do his will. Praise the Lord, my soul. This is the reading of God's holy word. All right, we will sing another hymn, Amazing Grace, and then you can rest your legs.
more thing before you sit. Just kidding. You may have your seats, and we'll have the welcome and announcements by Sister Jamela Williams. Good morning, church. It is another Youth Sunday here at 250 Bay Road and across our Baptist Union of Churches. As you would observe so far, the youth ministry is leading this morning's worship experience. Continue to pray for us that we will continue to be excited to support our ministry and to zealously take part as we grow closer in our walks with Jesus. It is my pleasure then to invite you all, members and visitors alike, on behalf of our pastor, Rev. Derek Hamilton. We are delighted that you have joined us and it is always our prayer that our time together here will be a transformative one, one that will draw us closer to God. Are there any first time visitors today? We are equally excited to carry out our Lord's command when we said to pray for each other. Mourn with those that mourn and rejoice with those that rejoice. We continue to e encourage each other to pray for the sick and shut-in of our church and community. Those that are grieving need our prayers, so let us continue to lift them up in prayer. We likewise continue to pray for our pastor and family our pastors and union of churches, our country and our country leaders. Let us remain vig vigilant in our prayers for Haiti as they continue to face huge challenges. We invite you to pray for our fifth and sixth form youths as they begin their final exams. We love to celebrate our church family and today we celebrate those who are celebrating birthdays and or anniversaries today or during the week. This week, we know of the following birthdays. Cheryl Williams, tomorrow, April 15th. Eric Smith and Clayton Thomas Sr., April 17th. Arnell Taylor Hall, April 18th. Judy Parker, April 19th. And Garvin Simmons, April 20th. Are there any other birthdays in the house? the birthday song. Happy birthday when your day comes around. And we also celebrate a wedding anniversary with Deacon Henry and Sister Carlene Wilson tomorrow, April 15th. May God continue to bless your marriage and home. And in the youth corner, we celebrate with Joe Day Harvey, who this past week signed with the University of Northwestern Ohio on a full soccer scholarship. <laughs> We are equally happy for and celebrate with Brother Ray Vaughn, Marky, Josias, and Pardon? Fig. who will travel to Penn Relay Relays this month. We are also excited for our brother Antoine, who has received a placement at the prestigious Howard University. We continue to be proud of our youth and invite us all to pray for them in all their endeavors. We continue to solicit your prayers and physical presence where possible as we continue to offer opportunities for fellowship and worship during the week. We meet this and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom for our weekly Bible study. 
The women, youth, and children will meet here at the chapel on Friday at 7 p.m. Sunday school takes place next Sunday at 9.45 a.m. There is a class for everyone. Special announcements. The 40th annual conference of the Caribbean Baptist Women's Union will take place here in Providenciales from July 25th to 29th. The theme for the conference is Sacrificial Life. Registration fee is now $125. Accommodation for the conference will be at Kokomo and is $800 per person, double occupancy. Those who, will, those who still plan to register, we urge you to register quickly before the online registration meets its maximum quota. If you have already registered online, please contact Sister Vula Hamilton or Sister Lucine Lightburn regarding payments for the conference, and thanks for your attention to this matter. Our theme today is centered, centered around Judgment Day. There are signs of the end of times everywhere, and it is so important that we prepare ourselves for our Lord's sure return. My question to you today, are you ready for the Judgment Day? We will all stand before God to receive our reward. Are we ready for Judgment Day? Because it is sure to come. Be blessed for the remainder of this service. Thank you. All right, we will <clears throat> now have the offertory prayer by Emmanuel Maranzi. Good morning, church. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of jobs and all means to earn money. Thank you for, the, for those that have followed your command to bring in their tithes and offering. Thank you for this ministry, and I ask that you multiply even what we have received so that it can do greater works for your kingdom here on earth. Bless the givers and the work of your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The members of the offertory selection, we call you now. in that home above trusting fully trusting in the Savior's love doing what I can for heaven hold me down I'm getting ready to leave this world I'm getting ready to leave this world getting ready for the gates of world keeping my record bright watching of the saving grace in each earthly trial that I have heard can trace show sure that up in heaven I shall find a place I'm getting ready to leave this world I'm getting ready Lord to leave this world getting ready for the gates of world keeping my record right watching Jesus said I'll go. If it were not true, I would have told you so. Just a little while to linger here below. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Getting ready for the gates of world. Keeping my record right. Watching both days. I'm good. 
Tiana Dean and Benson Williams Jr. for scripture. church today's scripture reading will be taken from matthew 24 verse 1 to 30. okay okay the reading from the niv version for those of you who want to okay as jesus left the temple courtyard and was walking away his disciples came to him they proudly pointed out to him the temple buildings Jesus said to them you see all these buildings sorry you see all these buildings don't you I can guarantee this truth not one of these stones will be left on top of the other each one will be torn down as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives his disciples came to him privately and said tell us when will this happen what will be the sign that you are coming again? And when will the world come to an end? Jesus answered them, be careful not to let anyone deceive you. Many will come using my name. They will say, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many people. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed. These things must happen. But they mean, they don't mean that the end has come. Nation will fight against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are only the beginning pains of the end. Then they will, then they will hand you over to those who will torture and kill you all nations will hate you because you are committed to me then many of then many will lose faith they will betray and hate each other many false prophets will appear and deceive many people and because of and because there will be many more lawlessness and people's love will grow cold but the person who endures to the end will be saved this good news about the kingdom will be spread throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. Then, then the end will come. The prophet Daniel said that, disgust, that the disgusting thing will cause destruction and you will stand in the holy place. When you see this, when you see this, those of you my bad. when you see this those of you in Judea should flee to the mountains those of you who are on the roof should not come down to get anything out of their houses those of you who are in the field should not turn back to get their coats how horrible it will be for women who are pregnant and who are nursing babies in those days. Pray it will not be winter or the day of rest, a holy day when you flee. There will be a lot of misery at that time and a kind of misery that has not happened from the beginning of the world until now and certainly will never happen again. God does not reduce the number of those days, no one will be saved. But those days will be reduced because of those who God has chosen. At that time, don't believe anyone who tells you, here is the Messiah, or there he is. False messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will work spectacular, miraculous signs, and do wonderful things to, des to deceive. If possible, even those whom God has chosen. Listen, I've told you this before it happens. So if someone tells you, he's in the desert, 
don't go out looking for him. And don't believe anyone who says, he's in the secret place. The Son of Man will come again, just as lightning flashes from east to west. Vultures will gather where, wherever there is a dead body. Immediately after this, the misery of those days, the sun will turn dark, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the universe will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the people on earth will cry in agony when they see the Son of Man coming on the, the clouds in the sky with, with power and great glory. This is the word of God. Yeah, some, some, some. We, you can have your seats for one second. We acknowledge the presence of Deacon Daniel Grant, leader of the Abesna Baptist Church in Sandy Point, North Caicos. Thank you for working with us, Deacon. We also take this time to extend sympathy to Brother Bennett Stubbs on the passing of Mackie Forbes, his uncle. We will now sing again my hope is built on nothing less. invite Maisha Stubbs to deliver a pressure point. Good morning, church. This morning's pressure point is on youth and judgment day. Youth have a tendency to avoid difficult situations. Truthfully, there are adults too that behave as we do and just coast along trying to avoid things that make us uncomfortable. We ignore stuff that we don't understand or that scares us, and Judgment Day is one. One writer correctly captures it when he said that the idea of Judgment Day can cause us to fail. We don't like the idea of being judged, but the Bible says, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. 
If we are free, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. On the day of judgment, things like money, beauty, and fame won't matter. So we shouldn't be putting our efforts into building up these things while we're on earth. Our focus should be on living in the way that God has called us to live, but with the recognition that we're never going to be able to be perfect here on earth. God's grace covers us, and he sees us the way he sees Christ, worthy and accepted. Without God's judgment, we couldn't have God's justice. Without God's judgment, we lose sight of our sin and the amazing grace that he gives us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. When we're in Christ, we can view Judgment Day the way he does, with confidence on that day. The focus will be on Jesus, and if we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, then we don't have to fail. What now? Ask yourself honestly, how do you feel if Judgment Day happened today? If there's only fear there, take those fears to God and ask him to help you work on them until you feel totally confident in him. Please pray for us, youth, that we would take these fears to God and that we would see the importance of living a life that is pleasing to God in recognition of the fact that we would face God's judgment. Thank you. Before we move on, I don't know if we have the time, Pastor, to, for me to tell a short story. But <clears throat> we often talk about the goodness of God. One of the songs that we heard this morning playing in the prelude talked about the goodness of God. And you know, I tend to get a lot of congratulations on accomplishments, but not a lot of people know the story. And you know, people always say that everyone is ready to celebrate with you, but not everybody goes through the struggles with you. And there's one person other than my mother who went through that struggle with me, and his name is Jesus. It didn't matter if it was 10 p.m., 3 a.m., or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and a class dozing off. God was always there with me. <clears throat> this year, it, it, it has been a, a testing of faith for me, I like to say. The year started December 17th last year. My cousin, probably the closest person in the entire world to me, most people know I call him a brother, died in a tragic boating accident. And the entire beginning of this year was surrounded with grief. It was surrounded with not only the planning, but the execution of a great funeral service in his memory at just 23 years of age. And moving through that wasn't easy. Getting through it wasn't easy. But I did, thanks to God. And continuing on through that month, I began to compete, went back to school in Jamaica at the end of January. And within the first week of training, I got injured. Tore five muscles in my leg, my left leg. So I competed with excruciating pain. But you know, when we talk about the goodness of God, I talk about breaking a national record on that one leg. Because God didn't allow me to sit down and feel sorry for myself. He didn't allow me to continue grieving and feeling sad. He allowed me to see the light in belief, not only in him, but belief in myself. And so I was able to move forward and, and, and bear with me for a few minutes. I hope I'm not taking too long. But God allowed me to see past everything that was going on in that situation. And I said the year has been a trying year because the following week, I would get news in Jamaica that Another brother, older cousin, was brutally murdered in his home in front of his family, shot seven times in front of his four children and his wife. Now, I, I still haven't processed that one, so I can't believe I've said it. But guess what? There's a goodness in God that has kept his family safe. There's a goodness in God that has allowed us to continue going. And Bethany, I want to say today, not only to you, but to the young people like me, don't allow small things to get in the way of your path. Excellence is a journey that starts with small, great steps. And you have to believe in the power of Jesus and his ability to carry you through. And so the sins of my past and the obstacles of my journey will never hold me back because of my belief in God. 
my belief in his healing power, my belief in his mercy and his love that endureth forever. And so when March comes and I'm told I might need to do surgery, I pray. I prayed with a lot of you here today and that is why I, went, I came up here and the first thing I said was how much I love my Bethany family because you were all here for me and I can't begin to thank you all for that. March began and I was admitted in the hospital for one whole week. I used to pride myself on the fact that I used to say God love me a little extra because I never spent a night in the hospital. Never in 18 years up until this year. One week in the hospital with appendicitis, told that I'd need surgery and I couldn't compete for the rest of the season. One day of prayer, just one day of prayer, Bethany, I'm telling you, one day of prayer allowed me to move forward. It allowed medication to start working, everything to start falling into place. And I was able to not only compete, but win medals. And, and Bethany, I say this not to gloat or not to, 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 to pump up any achievement. I say this to talk about how good my God is. How he is able to bless even the brokenhearted. And so now, five months removed, almost six months removed from my brother's passing, some nights I still cry myself to sleep. I'm ashamed to say it. There are some days I still can't understand how God could allow a 23-year-old young man with so much promise, so much life, so much left to give, not just to him, but to his family. How could he take him? But as pastor told me, God always takes the best. <laughs> and so he was my favorite, so I see him as the best. But he was truly the best of all of us. And so we have to recognize our blessings, Bethany. Don't allow your circumstance to block yourself from seeing your blessings. Always give praise. Always give thanks. Because God will never, ever leave you. I don't know if anybody else can relate with these stories I've shared this morning. But God was always there for me. And I'm here today to tell you that he will always, always, always be there for you. He will never leave you. We now invite Deacon Willard Swan to pray for you. that you'll become interested in the contents of this prayer. Interested enough to listen to it again. I thought to ask you to record it on your phones, but then I remembered we already got it on YouTube. Uh, thanks very much, team, for multiplying our ministry. So you, you, you'll have it. You can listen how and when you want. You can slow it down to one clause at a time. Think about that clause before going on to the rest. Next week, the week after, the prayer is still present. This is what Bethany is praying for you. And please don't be afraid to ask your questions. Let us pray. God, you who is our Father, thank you that, unlike most men, besides being creatures of yours, we are also your children. We call ourselves believers because that is what makes the 
separation between us and most men. We believe your word, your message. We accept him as our savior and our aim is to make him our Lord. Father, please grant that our youth know that belief and acceptance is both the fulcrum and the lever, the most important thing about us. Right and proper judgment is your discernment of what is right and wrong and your action, your right response. When our judgments, discernments and actions are right, they agree with yours. Thank you that you've judged, discerned, believers sin before the foundation of the world. You alone can do this because you are holy in your foreknowledge. You know the end before the beginning. In the fullness of time, you sent your son to, attain, to atone for all the sin of all believers. Thus, believers' sins are judged, responded to, punished at Calvary. We celebrated it on Good Friday that our sins are gone. We are no longer concerned with discernments about sin, only discernments about our work. The Christ of Calvary is our savior, seeing we believe you, Father, and have received him, fulcrum and lever. Our aim, our duty, our obligation is to make the Christ Lord, master, owner of our lives, that henceforth our work, our behavior should please him. I am saying that our judgment responsibility is to discern the quality of our own work, whether they please the Christ, and respond to what we have discerned, either with corrective action, course correction, or more of the same. Thus, Father, our prayer is that you would give us, your more mature children, deeper insight into fostering learning about you and your ways and give youth that we instruct courage and strength to use your standards that the discernments arrived at would agree with yours. After the descent and call, the Christ, the man through whom you would judge, discern, and respond, that Christ will discern and reward believers' works that endure. And Father, please grant that our youth have lots of good deeds that endure. Those who did not believe you, did not accept your message, did not operate the fulcrum and lever, we call unbelievers. Regardless to our evaluation of their work, in your discernment, they are incapable of performing any good deed. Their sins remain until the end of the world. The 
man through whom you would judge comes in different character. You are not their father. He is not their savior, not their Lord. Their sin and works will be judged together at the great white throne. Therefore, Father, our prayer is that unbelievers among our youth would see this ugly picture, become frightened by it, frightened enough to turn away from this dreadful end. That unbelievers also see the picture on the opposite side of the fulcrum, become attracted to it, attracted enough to embrace your message and messenger. Amen. The only thing that <clears throat> I, would, I would say to my fellow young people, in addition to Deacon Swan's prayer, and I thank you, Deacon Swan, for that, for that blessing. I've had, I've had the blessing of speaking at many graduation ceremonies as a keynote speaker. And the one theme that I always carry over, because you know graduation ceremonies have their own themes, their own spotlights. The one thing I always carry over is being audaciously excellent. It's something that I live by. It, and and I, I'd say this to my fellow young people because you say audacious because your parents often tell you the audacity, you know, the audacity to do this, the audacity to do that. Have the audacity to be excellent in everything that you do. Because guess what? With God, you have the ability to do everything that you want to do, everything that you dreamed of doing. And God has bigger plans for you than even you know. Even you can fathom. Live through him, live with him, and be audaciously excellent. Move forward without the struggle. Move forward without the pain. Move, move forward without the worrying. Because guess what? You see, with Jesus, you have a special privilege. There's a song that says, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So when your friend ain't answering you on FaceTime, don't be worried. FaceTime Jesus. We will now have a reading <clears throat> of Are You Ready for the Judgment Day by Sister Tanea Gardner. Good morning, church. Are you ready for Judgment Day? Christ the Lord has gone to glory, but he's coming back again. He's coming with his angels and a sword of fiery flame. Then all nations, tribes, and people shall be gathered around his throne to receive reward and recompense for all that they have done. There will be a separation on that final judgment day. On the right, the good, the left, the bad who walk in Sid's broad way. Come ye blessed. Then the judge will say to those upon the right, but depart to those upon the left, to darkness endless night. If you spend your time in seeking after wealth and earthly fame, unrepentant, disbelieving in his holy blessed name. If you live in worldly, in worldly pleasures and the Lord of life deny, indignation, wrath, and anguish is your portion when you die. Now prepare to meet your marker. Choose today the better part, while you hear his earnest pleading, his earnest pleading voice. O oh, harden not your heart, seek him while he may be found, and call upon him while he's near. Lest he laugh at your calamity and mock when comes your fear. Are you ready for judgment day? Are you ready for judgment day? You must stand before the Lord to receive your reward. Are you ready for that judgment day? We will now have a selection by Sister Raynell Mompremier, followed by Pastor Derek coming with the sermon.
Continue to shower his blessings on you as you seek to give him worth in your youth. It is good to have all of you here, and I acknowledge all of your presence. It's good for us to be here. We have been tiptoeing through the book of the Revelation. Um, we've covered a number of chapters so far. This morning we're going to look at the sixth chapter of the book, and I hope you've brought your Bibles. I I think it's important that as we do this, you read along with me and to get a, a good or a better understanding of what's happening in the text. Father, we thank you for the foregoing part of our service. We thank you, Lord, for how you would add your blessings to the songs and the prayers and the, the readings. We thank you, Father, that you would cause these to be meaningful to each of us. And we pray now that the words of my mouth and our hearts thinking will find acceptance in you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So we're in Revelation chapter 6. We're in Revelation chapter 6. Chapter 5 is over, and do um, you remember chapters 4 and 5? The scene is in heaven. And John's still in heaven. He's still in heaven. Before the... natural occurrence of storms on earth. There's always a warning. There's always a warning. Um, there, there are always indicators, you know, that a storm is coming. There are always. Whether we, whether we are conscious of it or not, um, the people back then who, who understood the, the, the natural phenomena, if you please, they knew, they knew. When the wind go in a certain direction or the birds fly in a certain direction, um, they would tell you something's gonna happen tonight, right? It's gonna rain or we're gonna have bad weather or something of that sort, right? Today, today, I speak of a storm that is coming. Now, the storm that I speak of that's coming is God's wrath, God's wrath. Of course, we would have heard from Matthew chapter 24, um, where Jesus says that there will be signs, there will be signs, and when we see them, we ought to begin to prepare, right? Um, there's a little jingle that goes, Everybody beware, you better prepare. Disaster could happen anytime, anywhere. 
right? You would have heard it, you know, on the radio and or on, on television, right? And that is precisely the case. Those who ignore, those who ignore the signs and refuse to prepare, in terms of being prepared for the coming wrath of God, risk, risk severe and eternal consequences. Be prepared. Be prepared. So Revelation 6 is the warning that precedes the onset of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is a seven-year period of intense control and persecution of the inhabitants of the earth, which precedes the millennial reign, the, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, right? Which conversely is a period marked by blessedness and peace. Hallelujah. I think we've agreed some time ago that the church of Jesus Christ will be safe from the events of the Great Tribulation. Here are several reasons why we've agreed that, right? Um, there is no reference of the church in Revelation um, 6 to 18. No reference of the church. And then there's the promise. There's the promise of Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going to save you from the tribulations, from the trouble that will be visited upon the whole world. And then there was the teachings of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. It talks about the rapture, the catching away of the church, and how, the, how that the day of Christ will come as a thief in the night. And then... There is the purpose of God in all of this. What's God's purpose? God has purposed the salvation of the elect, the salvation of the elect, and the salvation of the elect will prove that God is merciful, right? Because what we're going to see, that even in the great tribulation, even in the great tribulation, even in the wrath of God, there is mercy still. There is mercy still. And then, B, the purpose of, um, the purpose of God, the condemnation of the unsaved. The condemnation of the unsaved. God's justice demands that we pour, that he pours out his wrath on a rebellious world. He cannot but do it. He must do it if he's a just God. So we come to Revelation chapter 6 and we come to the first three judgments during the seven year period of time. The sealed judgment, the sealed judgments of chapter 6 and the trumpet judgments in chapter 8 and 9 and the bull judgments in chapter 16. The seal judgment seems to correspond with Jesus' teaching in the Mount Olivet Discourse. And that's why we had that passage read this morning. Jesus' disciples asked him, um, Lord, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? To which Jesus sought not to leave them in the dark. And so he tells his disciples what to look for. Right? He says, look for, look for, here's some, here's some indicators. He says, look for false Christs. Look, look for false Christs. Look for false messiahs. Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5 matches with Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, the rider on the white horse. Wars and rumors of war. Look for wars and rumors of war. Revelation 24, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, matches with Revelation 6, verse 3 and 4. 
the rider on the red horse. Wars and rumors of war. He says, look for famine. Now, yeah, there's always been famine. I've heard about famine from the time I was a little boy. Right? There's always been famine, but there's going to be famine. Look for famine as an indicator. Matthew 24, verse 7, matches with Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. Rider on the black horse. He says, look for death. Look for death. Look for death to occur in, 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 in mass. Revelations 20, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, verse 9, matches with Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8. The rider on the pale horse. He says, look for persecution and martyrdom. Look for persecution and martyrdom. Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10, matches with Revelation 6, 9, and 11. And we have there the martyr's prayer. And then terror and cosmic signs. Matthew 24, 7 and 29, matches with Revelation 6, 12 through to 17. Terror and cosmic signs. So John is privileged. John is privileged. And John is in this privileged position where he is able to see the commands of heaven. Right? He's right there. He's, he's able to see the commands of heaven or hear the commands of heaven. And he's able to see the consequences, the fallout on earth. Jesus gives a command in heaven. Right? Gives a command in heaven. And it places out on earth and all of what happens all of what happens has its origin in heaven I'm not just talking about during the great tribulation I'm talking about today everything in your life everything in my life everything in all of our lives originates in heaven you're quiet you're quiet. You're too quiet. Everything that occurs in the life of a believer, everything that occurs in the life of a child of God, ultimately begins in heaven and is a part of God's perfect plan for your life. Other than that, we couldn't quote Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. And we, and we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God. Right? All of it, all of it is a part of God's perfect plan. Nothing will ever happen to you without being approved by God. Nothing. Nothing will ever happen to a child of God without the purpose of God. A child of God, you are not a victim of chance encounters or random rendezvous. Your life is under the design and control of God. Listen to me. If you take nothing else away from, from, from the service today as a child of God, take this. Heaven rules on earth. Heaven rules on earth on earth and so we come to the first seal we come to the first seal chapter one verse one i watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals then i heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder remember we said that heaven is going to be a loud place even when one person is speaking here. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Back in the day, horses 
were a part of the instrument of war. Who is this rider on the white horse? Who is this rider on the white horse? Some people believe that this rider on the white horse is Jesus Christ. I don't think so. I don't think this, 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 that this is Jesus. Jesus will come on a white horse, but this is not Jesus. This is not Jesus. And, and the reason why I say that this is not Jesus is because you can't associate Jesus with the, the activities of any of the, 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 the horse and riders. Not, not here. This is not Jesus. So I'm going to hold a view that this is anti-Christ. This is the false Christ that Jesus told his disciples to look out for. This is the false Christ who's coming in seeking political domination. Check this. He has a bow, right? He has a bow, but he has no arrow. That's like today, you have a gun, but you have no ammo. He's, he's, you know you got a gun, but what's good is a gun without bullets. The only thing you can do is probably gun butt somebody. Right? But you can't shoot anybody. You have no bullets. And so this dude on the white horse, he has a bow, but he has no arrows. He's given a crown. And, and, and look at this. He is obeying commands. Not any command. He's obeying the commands of angels. Of an angel. Tell me. Is Jesus Christ subject to the commands of angels? That was a legitimate question. I say no. Jesus gives them command. He don't take command from them. So it seems to me, it seems to me that this is the very beginning of the seven-year tribulation and the reign of Antichrist. The crown suggests to me that he is given the authority to rule by God. He is given authority by God. The arrow, I'm sorry. He's given a bow. No arrows. Suggesting to me again that he assumes power and control without bloodshed, without opposition. Why is that? How can this be? You still with me? How is this possible? Okay. So remember, remember that at the end of chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, and, 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 and between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, what did we say happened there? We said the church is taken out of the world. Right? The end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, the blank spot there is the rapture. We're gone out of the world. Right? So this leaves, this leaves, this leaves a vacuum. This leaves a vacuum in the world. The world is now embroiled in chaos. You see, in chapter 6, John is in heaven, right? In, 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 um, the world is embroiled in chaos. The world is embroiled in, in confusion. The world is embroiled in uncertainty. Why? Because millions of people have left the planet. Millions of people have left the planet all of a sudden. And there is this huge vacuum. This huge vacuum. Global chaos. Anticipate with me the rapture. Anticipate with me. You will have planes falling out of the skies. You will have trains and buses and cars colliding on the streets. You will have ships drifting into each other on the seas. 
homes and churches and stores and other businesses will be emptied of Christians. Will be gone, gone, gone. And this will leave the world in an unsettled state. And this person, the Antichrist, this person on the white horse, this person will step onto the world scene claiming to be, I'm the only man that can solve the world's problems. And guess what? The moment he said that, he says that, you will have it. If you're, if you're still in the world, you'll have it on your cell phone. You'll hear all of this. And if there was an election, there'll be a global election, and you'll be able to vote. And you'll be able to vote for him. Yes, I can vote for him. Boom, 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 boom. And he comes to power. Why? Because your mommy just gone, your daddy just gone, your pastor just gone, your brother, your sister, your best friend just disappear. And everybody is in a panic. And this dude steps in and he says, I'm the fixer. I'm the fixer. And the world will accept him. You know why? Because the world would want normalcy. I can guarantee you, if that man on the white horse had come during COVID, it would have been a done deal. But it wasn't time. Because we were all frightened and everybody wanted, everybody wanted to come back to church and go back to work and go back to school and go back to back to back to back. And we would have just accepted it. But it wasn't just time as yet. It wasn't just time, not then. But there will come a time. The good thing about it is the church, the Christians would be gone out of the world. But the unsaved people, the people who rejects Jesus today, would be left on the earth. And you would accept this man, not knowing the people say the hell you accept him. Seal number two. Seal number two. Verse three. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Paul, Paul refers to the, to the Antichrist as the man of lawlessness. Say lawlessness. Paul re refers to the Antichrist as the man of lawlessness. Right? The man of lawlessness. If you are over 40, if you are over 40, you are shocked by what is becoming of our erstwhile serene Turks and Caicos. But what's happening in Turks and Caicos now pale in comparison to what we could expect during the seven year the tribulation. As I speak, this man that is going to be revealed on the, on the white horse and on this, this red horse. And I believe, the, I, I believe the same rider is riding all the horses, okay? Um, that's just my silly belief, right? But here's what the scripture says about this man. Scripture says that the Holy Spirit is right now in the age of grace restraining this man, right? The, the man is being restrained. But once the church is gone, the Holy Spirit would be gone, right? Once the church is gone, the Holy Spirit would be gone, would be taken out of the world. And once the church is taken out of the world, this man of lawlessness, he will unleash and usher in unchecked lawlessness 
in the world. Rebellion, home invasion, murder, corruption, in every hall, kidnapping, gang violence, civil, regional, and international wars, you name it. You name it. Lawlessness, wickedness, unchecked. Listen to me. Warfare, whether it's just between me and you, warfare is inevitable. It is inevitable. Warfare is born out of our fallen desire to be first. To be first, to be the man, to be in control. James, was it James who asked him, when comes such a desire? It comes from within, from within. From within. Though war is inevitable, as long as the church is in the world, it is the church's duty, responsibility to pray for peace. So that we can all live a harmonious life. It is our duty to promote peace in our circles. But we will never eliminate war from the face of the earth. People will always be fighting. But this fighting, this is a different kind of fighting. This is a different warfare here. The Second World War, World War II, was supposed to be the last war. As a matter of fact, in the United Nations, um, a year or so after the Second World War, um, they signed a charter that says this, this, this is the last war. But of course, you know, Vietnam and all of them things came after that, right? Since 1946, Uppsala University in Sweden has recorded that there were at least 285 conflicts around the world. And that's, all they, that's, that's, that's just what they recorded. 285. Right now as we speak, there are wars, there are conflicts going on in the world, but they are not on the scale of what would happen here. War is inevitable. The reality is, my friends, there will be no lasting peace in this world until Jesus Christ comes and make peace. No lasting peace. See number three. See number three. Seal number three. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scale in hands. Then I heard what sounded like the voice, like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage, six pounds of barley for a day's wage. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Sometimes I wish I was oil and wine. Nobody's going to touch you to do you harm, and everybody wants you. Do you get it? Famine. Famine. is unleashed on the earth. Famine is a natural outcome of war. I was listening to, to CNN the other day, and um, uh, I, rem I don't remember the name of the organization of whom, you know, the lady represented, but she was talking about how, how, how they are, are anticipating right now um, they're, they're on the brink of, of famine in Gaza, right? Famine is the natural outflow, outcome, if you please, of war. Wars are always accompanied by inflation, and whenever prices go up, um, commodity becomes scarce or impossible to purchase. And this is going to become true. Oh, 
during the great tribulation. One denarius was a day wages, right? One denarius was a day wages. And one denarius was able to buy eight quarts of, of, of wheat. Eight quarts of wheat, they tell me, lasted for a family of four for about a week, right? For about a week, seven days. If, however, you wanted to be cheap, you want to be tight, right? You wouldn't buy wheat, you'd buy the cheaper substance, barley. Less expensive, less nutritious. But you would get 24 quarts of barley for a day's wage. So you're like, what? You tripled it, right? right? You, get, you get three times. If you think, how much is, a, how much is a, a loaf of bread? How much is a gallon of gas in Turks and Caicos? How much is a, a, an hour's wage? If you think working one hour to buy a gallon of milk, a, a loaf of bread, or a gallon of gas is bad, wait until the Great Tribulation. You're going to have to work an entire day. You're going to have to work an entire day to be able to buy a loaf of bread. Look at it though, look at it though, he says, listen, don't touch the oil, don't touch the wine. Why? Because oil and wine are luxury items. Oil and wine are luxury items in any society. Right now today, oil and wine, luxury items. And the wealthy few will gladly purchase them at any cost. You're wealthy, you've got money. So no matter how expensive the oil is, no matter how expensive the wine is, I want it, go buy it. And people would be, be hoarding it by the truckloads. The wealthy, the wealthy few. Sadly though, Sadly though, the many, the many, the masses, won't be able to afford the wine and the oil. And whenever you have this kind of thing, you, it, it, it always breeds contempt and social unrest. Always. Whenever you have the few having too much and the many, have, and the many not having enough, you will always have tension. And to a large extent, that is what the brothers in Haiti is fighting against. The, the, the wealth of the rich not reaching down to the poor. So the rider on this horse is aware. He is aware of this fact. But since it is to his advantage, he keeps the world in this upheaval. He plays to the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Good politician, right? Hmm. Look at how, look at how shrewd he, he really is. Look how shrewd he really is. He's a real political genius. What does he have in his hand? What does he have in his hand? Man, you ain't with me. Let's go home. He has, a, he has a set of scales in his hands, right? He has a set of scales in his hands, right? And, 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 and with this scale, he hopes to bring about financial balance between the two classes, between the rich and the poor. He says, let me balance this. Most of the world, I, 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 a, a huge section of the world, um, deals with 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 with, with, with um, the capitalistic approach to to, um, to 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 finance and government, right? Capitalism. But he's going to usher in socialism. He's going to usher in socialism. He's going to try to to balance the equation between the two classes. 
Not that socialism is any better than capitalism or capitalism is any better than socialism. Both are weak structures of government. Both breeds corruption. But the Antichrist decides, you know what? Well, I'll try to, I'll try to reduce this upheaval, this, 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 this. I'll try to make this level. And so he introduces this socialistic type of, of, of um, government. He decides, right? He decides who buys and who sells. He decides. He decides. You know, Tony Evans, Tony Evans talks about this in, in, in one of his books, and he talks about how, you know, he, 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 he endorses the fact that socialism is the, is the econ economic system of the Antichrist, right? Um, but in my opinion, both systems, capitalism and socialism, are weak. Why? Because both systems are ran by people who are fallen, who are touched by sin, and every and anything sin touches eventually destroys. And that is why, that is why we will have to cope, the world, sorry, will have to cope with global famine in the last days. The world will have to cope with global famine in the last days. See number four, see number four, verse seven. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice, the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind. There was given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by wild beasts on the earth. So this plague is, this, this, this seal, this, this plague's name is death, and, and Hades is right behind. You know, so it's like death is the hatchet man, and, see, um, and, and Hades, hell, is the clean up man. So I can kill you, and they can put everything in the trailer, and we're going to hell. Hand and glove. Hand and glove. Somebody says the pale horse, this pale horse has the appearance of decomposing bodies. You would see this in the movies. You would see this in the movies. People running in the streets and they, 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 the arm falling off and the leg falling off and part of the face dropping down. You, 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 you see the movie trying to depict this. So much of what we read and see in the movies, you know, try to depict what's happening in scriptures. The world right now has eight billion people, they say. Right? It's eight billion people. Um, Uh, verse 8 says they were given power over one fourth one fourth of the earth to kill by sword famine etc 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 right so that means that at least two billion people will die during the tribulation Two billion people. They will die by sword. And, 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 and the word for sword here seems to suggest some mass destruction. Right? Some mass destruction. Not, not the hand combat thingy. Right? Um, they will die by famine. By scarcity, from scarcity of food. They will die from pestilence or plagues and or diseases. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine that amount of corpse, dead carcasses on the face of the earth in a short space of time? Think about it. 
I tell you what, if, you, if, if you're left behind, that'll be a good time to open a funeral home. And then there'll be death by wild beasts. Now, you can take that literal, but I don't necessarily take it literal. Right? There'll be death by wild beasts. It could be that the death by wild beasts can be animal-associated viruses and diseases. Remember, it's going to be global. If it's going to be death by wild beasts, I mean, all we have here is dogs, dogs and cats for the most part. Some iguanas and, you know, you know, nothing like that. So I guess be safe then, huh? If you're in Turks and Caicos. Uh, no, 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 no. I think you're going to be looking at chikungunya and COVID and, and, um, and swine flu and, and all of those things. Animal born diseases. Animal born diseases. Right? And they're going to just sweep the world. Listen to me. The point I make is this. You don't want to be in the world at this time. The truth is, you don't need to be in the world at this time. That is why Jesus died on Calvary to ransom you. That you may be forgiven from sin. Rescued from the terror of hell. You don't want to be in the world at this time. There is a way out. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The fifth seal. The fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just like, just as they had been. Here's the tragedy of Christians who will be persecuted and martyred for their faith. That's what we see here. This is during the tribulation, early days. Christians are killed during the tribulations, you say? Yes. Yes, Christians are killed during the tribulation. But pastor, I thought you say all of the church would be gone out of the world by then. Yes, all of the church would be gone out of the world. How would Christians, how would they be Christians killed during the tribulation? Well, there'd be no evangelists, right? We'll talk about that next time. We'll talk about that next time. But I'm going to leave Bibles in my house. We're recording right now on YouTube, and we're going to leave that recording. We ain't carrying that to heaven with us. You're going to leave Bibles and tracks and videos and songs, and all of those things are going to be left on earth. And the vacuum that is created is going to cause people to become hungry for, oh my gosh. And so people are going to begin to start searching and, and, and reading and, 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 and they're going to cry out to God. Some of them are going to cry out to God. And remember how we said that even in wrath, God is going to be merciful. God is going to answer some of their prayers and some of them will be saved. But it will be so difficult. And when you read the, end, the, the Matthew 24, 25, it tells you you know, how difficult it's going to be in those days for people to become saved and for even after you've become saved, how difficult it's going to be for you to be saved. And so people are going to be killed. People are going to be killed. People are going to be persecuted. And so you have, here you have the souls of persons who were persecuted. And they're asking God, God, how long are you going to allow this to happen? 
And God says, until the full number, until the full number of your fellow servants. So God is going to be saying to them, everybody that's supposed to die during the tribulation, as, 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 as Christmas, they ain't dead yet. We got some more time to go. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, friends. Don't bank on salvation by tribulation. Become saved now. Give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ now. Escape the tribulation. It's not necessary that you go through it. Any part of it. Your only salvation is to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ now. Now. The sixth seal. The sixth seal. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair with white I'm sorry, the whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the skies fell to earth as figs dropped from the fig tree while shaken by a strong wind. And the heaven recedes like a scroll being rolled out and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Until, until this point, until this point, only the poor people had been feeling the effects of the Great Tribulation up until this point. Only the poor was, was suffering, you know, and those Christians who, who were martyred, right? Um, and, 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 verse 16, and then, and then, they call to the mountains and the rocks because now it's beginning to impact all classes of people. The rich, the poor, the generals, the rulers, all classes of people and they all together almost i guess in unison they cried out to rocks and mountains fall on us hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb this is interesting this is very interesting why did i say that why did i say that here you have here you have the rich the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the mighty, rich, poor, slave, free, black, white, I mean, you name it. You have all of them now in where, with whichever locale they are in the world. They see Jesus, the Lamb, and God on the throne as heaven is opened. The sky is split. All right? Take this concept, if I can give it to you very, very quickly. So you have a scroll. And it's like this scroll is rolled up from both ends. Right? This scroll is rolled up from both ends. So this, this represents um, the... the, the the heavens at that time so the scroll is split the scroll is split and it just rolls one hand go this way and the next hand go this way and they see Jesus and they see God and in seeing Jesus and God they see wrath they see pending judgment they see something they don't want to deal with and so they begin to pray but guess what they pray to the wrong thing They pray to the wrong thing. They pray, hide us. They pray, kill us. They pray, we would rather be dead than to live and suffer. What did they hide from? What did they want to hide from, rather? Did they want to hide from the earthquakes? Did they want to cry, hide from the volcanoes? 
from the possible meteorites falling from the sky? Did they want to hide themselves from the what is possibly nuclear fallout? No. Look at the text again. Look at the text again. They say, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. That's God. And from the Lamb, Jesus. Hide us from them. These kings and rulers and slaves and, and free people, they make up the remaining millions of people who survive the tribulation thus far. Not only do they, did they survive the tribulation thus far, but they continue to reject Jesus. So they came into the tribulation, no doubt, rejecting Jesus. And up until this time, they're holding fast to their rejection of Jesus. They will see heaven open. They will see Jesus. They will see the Lamb. They will see Jesus who died for them, sitting on the throne. And instead of running to him, hear me now, instead of running to him, instead of praying to him, they pray to the rocks and the mountains. You see where the man got the inspiration from for the song that our young sister sang? They, instead of praying to Jesus, instead of praying to God, they prayed to the rocks and to the mountains. They prayed, hide us. They prayed, kill us. Because we cannot withstand the wrath of God, him who sits on the throne, and the wrath of the Lamb. Kill us. Kill us. Kill us. I can promise you this. If it were me, if it were me, I think, I think I would be begging, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, please have mercy on me. Lord, please save me from the wrath that is to come. But no, no, then again, I don't think so. You see, because no doubt what happened to them is precisely what may have happened to me, right? What happened to them is precisely what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had sufficient time to repent. Pharaoh had sufficient time to give his heart to Jesus Christ, to the Lord. He had sufficient time. Nine plagues. Nine plagues visited Egypt. Nine times. It says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then at last, it says God hardened his heart. Not that God sealed him off. No, he had, said, he had said nine times already, I don't want anything to do with this God. I'm God of Egypt. Nobody else. He couldn't say yes anymore. He couldn't say yes anymore. He couldn't say yes anymore. And I think the same thing applies here. The same thing applies here. Their callous hearts were so hardened that they preferred to pray to the rocks instead of pray to God. Who are you praying to today? Who are you believing in right now for salvation? What are you believing in now for salvation? Will you turn to Jesus right now? Or will you continue to believe in what you've always believed in? My personality, my smarts, my ingenuity, my... Who will you believe in? That's what these people did. They, they cried to the rocks. They cried to the mountains. Hide me. Fall on me. Kill me. My friends... This is the tragedy of putting salvation off for some more convenient time. Jesus says, today, if you hear my voice, don't encourage a callous heart. Be prepared. 
be prepared. I think every unbeliever knows that he, she deserves the full strength of God's wrath. But instead of ret returning to God and appealing to God, they try to avoid it. And in this text, you see what they do. They appeal to death. They appeal to death. But death is not an escape from the wrath of God. I know people say, yeah, when you're dead, you're done. Liars. Don't let them deceive you. When you're dead, you ain't done. Death is not an escape. If by death you escape the wrath of God in this life, you are unable to escape the eternal judgment at the great white throne judgment. There's no escaping. There's no circumventing it. There's no getting around it. Every unsaved person will stand before the great white throne judgment. Every saved person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is no getting around it. When you're dead, you ain't done. When you're dead, you ain't done. You've got the judgment to deal with. Which, which, which judgment seat are you going to stand in front of? Forget the judgment, the, the great white throne judgment, my friends. I appeal to you in the name of Jesus, choose the judgment seat of Christ. Choose the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ offers forgiveness. And that is the only way to avoid the great white throne judgment. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Did you notice? Did you notice? The people in the text, they were given, they were given white, white robes. They were given white robes. Which signifies the forgiveness that Jesus provides. only remedy for sin. The only way out of the judgment of God at the great white throne judgment. If I were you, if I were you, and if I were uncertain that if I were to die right today, I'll spend an eternity with Jesus in heaven. I'd give my heart to the Lord right now, right now. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? Years of time has come and gone Since I first heard it told How that Jesus will come again someday If back then it seemed so real I just can't help but feel how much closer his coming is today. Wars and strife on every hand and by
cannot say with certainty that when he comes I'll be going with him you need to make peace with God you need to make peace with God as we stand and sing our closing song Christ returning I encourage you if you make a decision for Christ we'll be happy that you would come and to Communicate that with us. It is so important, my friends, to know that to leave this world is to go and be with the Lord Jesus, the Christ.
a popular funeral song. I don't know, I probably like funeral songs due to my personal circumstances now, but it's a song I remember hearing for the first time at my grandmother's funeral 10 years ago. And the song says, it's all right now for I am in my Savior's care. And it goes on to say, it's all right now because my Savior hears and answers prayer. He walks beside me as I climb the heavenly stair and everything is all right now. So Bethany, be not dismayed by the thoughts of the ends of time because it's all right now. By then it will be all right because you will be in your Savior's care. No one can pray you into heaven but yourself. No one can ask for your forgiveness from God. And so as we leave here today, don't just hide the word in your heart. Share it with someone else. Share it with someone you wish to be there with you rejoicing in the pearly gates, in the eastern gates, in the place of love and peace. Let us pray. Father, thank you for bringing us here today to celebrate another Youth Sunday. Thank you for blessing our pastor with the word that you laid on his heart. Thank you for allowing us to come here safely, and I pray that we all return to our homes just as safe. In your name we pray, amen. <laughs>